Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our fourth session of our nine part emergency planning series. Today's session will focus on emergency preparedness planning, health equity in emergency preparedness. My name is Allie Elbers and I'm a quality improvement advisor with Superior Health Quality Alliance. I will be facilitating today's call along with my Superior Health colleagues, Tony Kettner and Christy Fable. Before I introduce our speakers for today's call, I want to take a few minutes to review some housekeeping items. We will post the slide deck several times in the chat box. Feel free to also add questions and comments into the chat box as you think of them. We will answer them at the end of the call. There will also be an opportunity later in the call to ask live questions. The series is being recorded and will be available on the Superior Health YouTube page in about two weeks following this session. This will allow you and your team access to the recordings on demand when it is convenient for you. We will post an evaluation link at the end of today's call. We would really appreciate if you would fill that out and it helps us um, to improve calls in the future. And so at this time, I would like to introduce our speakers, Brian Kazmarski and Amy woolman Nesif. Thank you, Amy and Brian, for joining us today. Thank you very, very much. Um, so I think most of you are familiar with us by this point, if you've been participating in this series, um, but Brian and I are co-owners of Optima Emergency Preparedness Consultants, um, as well as our work with the Healthcare Emergency Readiness Coalitions in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and we come with other uh, background, um, but I'm not gonna spend time on all of that today. Today, we're talking about health equity, which is in, in this entire series, this is one of the difficult ones to kind of wrap our heads around, I think. Um, at least it has been for me as I've prepared for this. Um, but, I, but I think in general, this is a difficult topic for us to really come to a, a good, clear understanding of, first of all, what it is, and second of all, how we can uh, try to improve our ability to, to reach health equity. So we're going to start by defining what is health equity in very broad terms. We're going to talk about one of the key factors or one of the key barriers to health equity, which is the social determinants of health. We're going to talk about the connection between health equity and health literacy, which will be our topic of session number five, will be health literacy. So make sure you tune back in for that one. And then we're going to talk about ways um, to embed health equity into our emergency preparedness response. And we'll talk about why that is so important in just a few minutes. And then we'll talk about um, the benefits of doing emergency planning with a health equity lens. And again, um, we know from experience, especially in the pandemic, that we failed in many ways with health equity. Um, that is probably the number one um, learning that the state of Wisconsin, at least, and I would guess the country as a whole, um, has come to, is, is coming to terms with is the fact that we need to do a whole lot better with health equity. So what is health equity? According to the CDC, it's basically saying that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. So what does that mean? Um, equity and equality are different. And this is, I think, a really basic foundational concept that we need to understand. Equality means that we have enough for everybody, right? If I have a basket of apples, I have an apple for everyone. But equity is making sure that all people have the ability with their skills, their resources, their tools to actually get to that apple. And we're gonna give an example, um, several examples of how this did not work um, with emergency preparedness. So how does this relate to emergency response? We know if, if health equity is not the, the baseline, if we, if we are facing social disparities in our culture that is preventing health equity on a good day or what we call a blue skies day, we know and we have evidence to prove that when there's an emergency situation, people who live without health equity on a good day suffer even more greatly in a time of crisis. 
And so we need to, to be aware of that and make sure that we are including health equity in our planning for those not blue skies days. And I think it's something that we can all agree that health equity is something that we all wanna strive for. It's something that we all hope we can accomplish, but we will talk a little bit about why those barriers exist and why it is so difficult for us to achieve. So the bottom line is health equity will never be achieved until the health disparities are addressed. And Brian's gonna go into this a little bit more about what is the foundation of our health disparities. According to the CDC, it says that health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health. So we know that we have populations in our country, in our states, whether it's Michigan, Wisconsin, or Minnesota, where we have populations of people who are disadvantaged because of their economic status, because of their geographical location, or because of other environmental factors, whether it's education or transportation or many other language uh, barriers. My hope is that a lot of you are familiar with what's known as the Social Vulnerability Index, or SVI. It's something that you can Google. It is um, an index that is maintained by the federal government, but you can drill down into actual zip codes to see where the disparities are. And if you look at a map, you can see um, whether it's economic disparities, whether it is age related, whether it is language related, et cetera. And I know a lot of our public health agencies use these SVI maps as a way to really look at how are we making um, health equity a priority, especially during the pandemic. But it's a tool that is used um, in, as I said, the blue skies days as well. So as I said, let's talk about those apples, okay? If I have an apple for everyone, that's equality. But the person over here, doesn't have the opportunity to get that apple because they have a disadvantage, okay? In this case, it's a height disadvantage. So health equity would mean that I have provided the tools and the resources for that person with the, with the height disadvantage to be able to reach what is available to everyone. And I think this is just a really good illustration of the difference between equality and equity. There was also a document that was published um, several years ago now um, by, help me, Brian, Public Health, somebody. American Public, Health, American Public Health Association. Thank you. That talks about what is the code of ethics for public health. And this isn't just for public health entities, but it's basically for any health and any healthcare organization that is worried about the health of the community or the health of the whole community. And so one of those foundational code of ethics pieces is that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being of himself and his family. And this is just this is not just absence of illness or disease, but it's how do we achieve our best health in mind, body and spirit. Um, for again, for all people. And so health equity, the ability to all achieve the healthy outcomes and the health that we're striving for is a foundation foundational principle of this. Without health equity, you can see that even if we have equality, we don't necessarily have equity. Brian. Thanks, Amy. So I'm sure most folks have heard a, a similar um, similar concept called root cause analysis. And looking at root cause analysis really boils down to what are the, what, what are the primary drivers of whatever the issue is. Um, as a society, we tend to do Band-Aid fixes. So we don't necessarily look at root cause analysis um, and understand that if we invest in those root causes, all of the intermediary and tertiary outcomes are going to go away as well. Um, so 
what we really want to focus on um, your patients, the different provider types that you that you have, and the families of the patients that you work with, and even the community that your facility resides in. Having an understanding of the social determinants of health will lend itself well to emergency planning. Um, and these are some of the biggies that show up. If you did a lit review online, you would find likely these that are identified in the bullet points, um, but more as well. So social community context, economic stability, education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, and then your neighborhood and built environment. And that neighborhood and built environment one is interesting. It's essentially, do I feel safe in my home? Um, are my streets lit well at night? Do I allow my kids to go out and play at night? So things like that. And that impact our overall health. Um, next slide, Amy. For some reason, mine goes away and I cannot change it. So a little bit of um, lit review just to share with you guys. Um, you can click on the links for, for further information, but we wanted to try to paint an example of some of the provider types um, that are on this call today and some of the, what the data already shows. And you can see out of the vital health statistics, just a few little tidbits here. Uh, adult day service center participants were the most racially and ethnically diverse among the seven sectors, seven provider types that were identified in this meta analysis. That's already um, an inequity. So the people that are being served in that particular facility come into that facility with pre existing health disparities. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, more than one quarter of service users in each of the seven sectors had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or other dementia, and more than one half of the services in each sector had a diagnosis of hypertension. Okay, And we all know what's happening around the national debate around um, hypertension, um, leading to potentially diabetes, and the call for national pharmaceuticals to lower their prices. What they're attacking is they're attacking policies that will hopefully bring the price of those ph pharmaceuticals down so that it is equitable for everybody that has conditions like that. Um, percentage of service users using Medicaid as a payer source was highest in adult daycare centers. That would tend to suggest um, economic disparities. So again, things to think about there, slightly lower with nursing homes, because in general, they come with slightly more resources um, at their hand. And then you can see the statistics go down and down and down based on the provider types. If I have the luxury of having some type of home health program, where I have the ability to stay in my home, um, that's a bonus, that's a win. And it's different than those people that are in congregate living locations, their benefits to being able to still live at home. And that all boils down to root cause issues of resources. And then the last one I wanted to mention, 88% um, of the individuals in the seven provider type sectors that they identified would qualify as being considered functional and or access needs. Um, and that's very telling. Um, and the reason that I, I wanted to mention that one is, you know, the, the worst nightmare for most of us that are on this call is that we have to evacuate our facility. That's, that's the big one. And if, God forbid, we ever would have to do that, Having an understanding of what the functional and access needs are of your patients is critical because during that transition, something's going to get left behind. There may need to be a temporary supply of pharmaceuticals because you left them back at the facility. And understanding how broad functional and access needs are. 
Okay. If you truly look at the definition of functional at risk needs versus the old terminology, which used to be special needs, um, it really broadens the scope of resources that we need to be able to think about as providers um, to be able to provide and or get for our patients that are going through whatever that incident is. Next slide, Amy. So health equity and health literacy, okay? The, 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 the connection between these two is if for whatever reason, your patient or your family struggles with health literacy, the ability to clearly understand the health information that you are giving them, they are going to struggle to make an informed decision, which is gonna put them at an equitable disadvantage as opposed to somebody who would have a clear understanding of that information. And that is the segue into why health equity is important in emergency preparedness planning. The concept of keeping it simple makes it more likely that people are gonna have a clear understanding of what your policies, procedures, um, and protocols are in the event that you have to deal with something that is outside of the scope of a blue sky, okay? So I'm thinking most people have heard of the class standards, culturally, linguistically appropriate services in healthcare. It's a model. Um, it's a model that allows you to look at plans, policies, um, any resources that can be disseminated out to um, your target audience. Um, and it goes through very simple strategies and tools that you can use to make those materials um, have a higher level of health literacy so that that equity piece can be considered. Um, Amy, did you want to talk a little bit about the diagram? Because I do think it's relevant. Well, so the picture here, um, hopefully some of you are familiar that, with this. This is what's called a story cloth. Um, that is from the Hmong community. And I don't know how many of you are aware, but many of the textiles that are produced by the Hmong community have very similar symbols and, and typical patterns. But a story cloth is unique to the Hmong culture in the sense that they tend to tell the story of a particular family or an individual. So for example, in this one, it's tell if you start down at the lower right-hand corner, it starts to tell the story about military occupation. It talks about this family's flight from their country, what life was like in the refugee camps, and eventually what that meant for their relocation to other, other places. And this is just an example of how, when we aren't familiar with a culture, sometimes we have to use many different tools to communicate with each other. Um, this is obviously a, a very, broad example, but I think it's really an important example of how different cultures, different languages um, talk um, in different ways and communicate in different ways. So, you know, don't always assume that um, translating something into English or, or from English into another language is all you need to do. You know, this, if you have an opportunity to have something like a story cloth in your facility or in somebody's home or wherever it is that you're encountering a, encountering a patient, take time to ask about their story um, because this is an illustration of, of that family journey. So Brian didn't know that, so he just wanted me to share that. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Appreciate that. Next slide. Um, one of the pieces that I want to piggyback and emphasize from what Amy said is um, the concept of interpreting or translating from one language to another. Um, we all know that there's tools and resources, there's interpreter talk lines, there's the ability um, to do telehealth and bring in an interpreter um, to go between the provider and the patient and or their family. Um, how many people have heard of Google Translate? So it's one of the tools and resources that is part of the Google um, conglomerate um, and maybe you've used it before. The concept is you you punch something into this inbox 
text box, and then you choose the language that you want it interpreted to. Um, if any of you have ever used that, it, it's a good resource, but it's about 60% accurate. So what that means is 40% of what you're entering into that is not going to come out the way that it was intended to come out. So just some things to keep in mind. Um, talking a little bit about translating over into disaster response and, and planning. So think about what we experience frequently in our country. We just got through a pandemic, wildfires happening all the time. And it seems like the, the area, the geographical area that are becoming more susceptible to wildfires continues to grow. And when you think about wildfires, really what you're, you're talking about is that's an evacuation situation. Um, it, it's usually a shelter in place for a period of time, um, but it's going to end up in an in a evacuation. Urban flooding, what that tells me is um, you could have water within your facilities or you could be isolated. You could be cut off from the rest of your community. And then you're getting into that shelter in place concept and you're looking at the potential of scarce resources. So thinking about that, who has power and resources pre-disaster is likely going to have more resources post-disaster, unless they were directly impacted by that disaster. So as a responder, we need to think about, again, cultural and experiential history, level of trust with government officials, and it's always a good idea. We all know assuming and all of the issues that go along with assuming. Um, Amy and I can't stress enough. If you're dealing with a patient during a time of disaster um, and you're wondering, what can I best do for this person? Ask them. Ask the question. Hey, I, I, I see that you're struggling right now. I know that what we're going through is a difficult time. What do you need right now? And that's that concept of number one, personalizing it. And number two, they're going to tell you what they need. And generally what they're going to tell you that they need is one of those things that's going to help them with a functional or access need. So one of the things that we embed into our preparedness plans is we as first responders, because that's what we all are now, um, we don't have all of the answers. So don't forget to include your target audience in empowering them to be able to articulate what they need to you. And it's going to end up saving time on both sides. Next slide, Amy. So thinking about your patients. So those who need skilled care in general, these are generalities. Okay, I understand that there are exceptions to these score lower on the social determinants of health. That's that SVI that Amy talked about, social vulnerability index. And what it really boils down to is resources and options. The fewer that they have, the more socially vulnerable that they are. And the greater the health disparities become. They have less resources to leverage in, during a disaster. They're more likely to need assistance during the disaster and they're more likely to have chronic negative outcomes as a result of the disaster. So in all areas of response and recovery, the people that we're talking about that have these functional and access needs and lower levels of the social determinants of health, we will need to apply more time and resources to them to get them back to pre-event levels. And one of the examples I want to give you is a jurisdiction in Wisconsin that we did um, a bunch of vaccine clinics for. It's Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Um, and I'll get, they, they had um, some very public, um, open, very commonly known landmark type sites that they picked out for some of their vaccine clinics. And what they were hearing is that the people that had transportation issues weren't able to get out to these locations because they were a little bit outside of the city. And so they knew their throughput was high, but they knew that the, the, the demographics of the throughput 
or people that had the resources and capabilities to get there. So they identified um, a vaccine clinic closer to downtown with the intention of the people that have transportation issues, then that's, that's a barrier that we can eliminate for them. And what they found out is they still weren't getting um, the population that they wanted to provide that opportunity for. And it took a little bit more digging, but talking with local agencies and agencies that work with these populations, they said, you need to put it on the bus line. You need to put your location on the bus line and because that is the mode of transportation that the majority of the intended target audience was using. And as soon as they did that, throughput increased and they were able to put a dent in the vaccination rates of that particular population. So it's thinking outside the box. It's looking at your community and your residents, and in your case, your patients, and saying, anticipating what, what are their needs going to be when we have to do X, Y, and Z, and then applying them not only to your plans, um, but to, to when you are exercising it, um, and then in the event that you may have to actually implement it. So again, thinking of, oh, let me go back one second, Amy, thank you. Um, again, people with addictive tendencies before the bad thing, those addictive tendencies are going to become stronger during and after the bad event. And you're going to need to plan for that. Who are some outside partners and resources that can come in and help with that? Mental health issues will be exacerbated during, a, during an incident or event. So do you have enough mental health providers um, at the ready? This is where it gets into community partners. If you had a significant event within your facility, could you tap in the mental health professionals within your community and have them come in and be able to provide support and resources? Those are the types of, of agreements um, that you want to consider with some of your key partners. All of these assumptions should be pre-identified. One of the things that most public health agencies do is they have an at-risk populations plan. And what we, the guidance that we give to the public health audience is, and again, keep in mind, they're, they're, they're looking at, that, at their entire jurisdiction, not just their patients within their four walls. But the goal is number one, identify your at-risk populations, okay? and where they're geographically located. And the second piece, and this is where people don't often think of this second piece, but become familiar with the agencies that work with those populations on a day-to-day -day basis. They're going to be your conduit to them during the emergency. There's no need to recreate a distribution list to target that audience because there's already an agency that has created that distribution list. Next slide, Amy. So this is um, this is, I think, the summing up what Brian was just talking about. That those in society who experience um, difficulties with health equity, with health disparities in the blue sky days, we know will be more impacted in the bad times. And again, all you have to do is think about some of the national struggles and disasters that we've had. I think particularly of when I was deployed to uh, Hurricane Harvey down with the Red Cross. Um, we had shelters open for that period of time and the vast majority of people that were in those shelters were people who did not have social connections or family that lived close by. So they didn't have anywhere to go. So they ended up coming directly to the shelter. We had people that um, had very severe mental health issues or Alzheimer's issues, dementia issues, addiction issues that were cut off from the resources that they normally had because of the urban flooding and because of the hurricane. And so the shelter population um, really was um, a perfect example of how health equity um, was not accounted for as much as it could have been um, during that disaster. The other 
the example I would give would be Hurricane Katrina. Now I understand we don't have Katrina or we don't have hurricanes up here in the upper Midwest, but just as another example, Hurricane Katrina, the, the message went out, it's time to evacuate. And people who had the resources, who had the vehicles, who had money to buy fuel, who had money to get to hotel rooms um, out of the area were able to do that. They were able to evacuate. But there were significant numbers of people who didn't have those resources. And so they were the ones that were stuck during that hurricane and ultimately needed to be sheltered, evacuated. And many of those people were dispersed throughout the entire United States. In fact, I think there was a sizable population that came up to the Milwaukee area, as well as other parts of the country. And many of those people have never returned to, our, to New Orleans. Um, because again, they lacked the resources in order to rebuild. Um, and even if you go down um, today, there are parts of New Orleans that have not been rebuilt. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the health disparities, the economic disparities, and all the other things that went into that experience. Again, I think the COVID pandemic is another great example of this. We know, Brian gave a great example, but we know that there are certain populations within our states in the upper Midwest that did not have um, the access or the ability to get to the vaccines, to the testing, to the resources that were needed. Um, and that is something that as we look as a country to how we can improve our infectious disease planning, um, taking health equity into consideration is a big part of that. And even within the Department of Health Services, at least in Wisconsin, they have actually embedded what they call health equity specialists into every department within the Department of Health. Um, as, because of the criticism and because of the gaps that were identified during that response. So as Brian said, this is a must do. This is something that we must build in um, to our planning assumptions. As Brian said, we need to identify our at-risk patients. We need to know who our patients are. And most of us have a pretty good understanding of that on a day-to-day -day basis. But again, when there is a crisis, some of those other behaviors, some of those other needs may come to the fore. And so having a good understanding of that um, and, and taking time to triage at the time of the event to reassess your patients to see where the needs are is super important. So for example, we know during COVID, a lot of our patients were not able to have, well, none of our patients were allowed to have visitors at certain points during the pandemic. And for those patients that were really dependent on having their wife or their husband or their children come to assist with feeding or to assist with some of the daily cares, or just to provide that you know, daily cribbage game or whatever it may be, those were the people that really suffered um, in, this, in this time. And we saw evidence that people lost weight, they developed other kind of depression issues because they were isolated. And that was true for many of our patients. Um, but that's just an example of how do you um, anticipate that um, a patient that is especially dependent, if it's a dementia patient, on that kind of personal care from family members, um, when that is taken away, how do we anticipate that that may be an additional need that we have to, to staff up for or get ready for? Staffing, this is something that Brian and I have talked about many times before. Um, we all like to think that our families um, or that all of our employees have great preparedness plans and we're ready to drop everything when the need arises at work and we're just going to come and show up. But what we know from studies is that only about 40% of your staff will actually show up during an emergency. And that is because they have other responsibilities to their children, to their parents, to their elders, to their pets, whatever the issue may be. And they simply are not able to respond. You need to take that into consideration. And maybe it's not just that they have other responsibilities, or maybe they don't have the resources to, to make that extra trip. Um, who knows what the rationale may be, but we have to plan for this fact. 
that we are going to be working with fewer people than on a daily um, or what we would expect for our entire staff. If it's an all hands on deck kind of call, we're not going to get everybody that we expect. Also, think about your families and your next of kin to your patients. Who's going to be challenging to work with? Who is going to be helpful? Who can you call upon to help when there are extenuating circumstances? Who's going to be banging on the door looking for information? Um, those are all things that you need to be thinking about as you are planning how we are going to um, not only provide equal information, but equitable, equitable information, making sure that all of the people that we have a responsibility to are able to receive and accept that information as best we can provide it. Community, are they prepared? What does your community as a whole look like in terms of health equity? Um, do people have access? Do they have resources? Do they have the ability to, um, to depend on one another? Are they interdependent or are they terribly dependent on, on um, resources um, outside of the region? Might your facility become one of those hubs during a disaster? If the power goes out and you are the only facility that has a generator, are you gonna have people in the community coming to you looking for assistance with recharging their cell phones or using your generator to power their CPAP machine that night or whatever the resources may be that they are looking for. That is something to be aware of. Where do you fall on that SVI index as a community? Um, be aware of what those gaps may be. And then partners and citizens. What are your partner's plans? One of the classic examples that we often encounter when we're doing exercises with nursing homes or with other types of assisted living facilities, if we get to the point in the exercise where we say, you have now reached the point where you are not able to function, you have infrastructure damage, you have power's been out for too long and you can't maintain your minimum and your maximum temperatures, you need to evacuate. Where are you going to go? And if it's impacting a larger community where there are multiple nursing homes, for example, that will be evacuating, and if they all are going to the same place, we have a problem. Or if they're all using the same transportation resources, we have a problem because we're all looking for the same resources. So we need to be thinking through, again, where are our resources coming from? Um, do we have variety? Um, do we have plan A, B, and C for potentially scarce resources? Because again, health equity is 100% dependent on your resources. So I wanna give one more example. Let's say you do have to evacuate. And we can say, well, we've given everybody the equal opportunity to get on a bus to evacuate. That doesn't work because not everybody in your organization can climb the stairs to get into a bus. So how are you gonna provide equitable opportunities for evacuation? Um, you have to think through what other tools do we need in order to get our residents, our patients onto that bus. And there are ways to do it, but it has to be part of your planning. Brian. Thanks, Amy. We talked a little bit in a earlier presentation about what's known as an LEPC, Local Emergency Planning Committee. In your jurisdictions, it may be called something else, but go to the table with, with these groups because these are the groups that talk about these issues and work through these issues. Um, get to know those people. That's where your agreements get made. Um, that's where you have the ability to say, we know that we have a gap in this area, but we can partner with you to close that disparity gap. That's why it's so important to identify your partners in your plans and what your partners can bring to the table. So again, general rules for at-risk planning. And again, think within your four walls, think within your families of the patients that you're serving, 
and think within your staff and their families. Know your at-risk populations and where they are. Develop those communication channels with agencies that already serve them. Amy talked about that 40% rule when it comes to staff showing up for an event. Does anybody know what hospitals do to try to mitigate that? They work with, think of a big snowstorm where people can't get to work. They, they really focus on two things. They focus on opening up transportation pathways so that their staff can get to work, okay? And they focus on providing in-house daycare. And that's eliminating two potential disparities that hopefully will allow more of their staff to get to work. There's no reason that your facilities can't have those same agreements in place. Talk with your county um, um, transportation through and say, if this happens, can you help us? Here's where some of our staff live out in these isolated areas. Can you help us plow and clear routes out to them so we can get our workers in? A lot of them will prioritize those as um, you know, the first passes that they make when they start to do their, their snow removal. And, and then again, um, that, that in-house or close to in-house daycare, um, staff want to show up, um, but if they have to choose between their kiddos, and coming to work, we all know what they're going to choose. So take that away from them. Take that take that um, that decision away from them by providing that resource. Next slide, Amy. So what I often recommend to people is we all have our emergency response plans. Some of them um, are very broad and robust. We all know that none of them are perfect. We all know that there are gaps um, in some of our plans. But what I always do is I tell people when you when your plan is all said and done, you, it should go through two stages of review. It should go through a health literacy review and it should go through a health equity review. That could be the same person. It could be different individuals. It could be a team. But if you have people going through and reviewing your plans through those two lenses, you have the ability to, number one, close a lot of gaps where there's confusing information, and number two, prevent issues down the road when you have to tap into that response plan, um, and it becomes necessary to look through that. So we can have we can build health equity into our response plans. It's not something that we think about at the time of the incident. But again, those those ethical principles um, really can be really can be the foundation of your plans. And it's right through the whole cycle of preparedness that you can look at things from a health literacy slash health equity standpoint. Next slide, Amy. Thank you. The socio-ecological framework, okay? So this is a model um, of what's known as population health. So it's kind of looking at the broad ecosystem of what allows us as humans to live our best possible lives, going back to that original definition of health equity. So within these areas, there is a culture there is a philosophy and the one i want to target is how does the united states perceive its elderly as opposed to other countries and you can think about that and answer that question on your own um but because there are their own unique cultures in all of these levels there's going to be health disparities at all of those levels the best place to address that, the most efficient place to address that is at the policy level. And the example I'm going to give you is we are about to end an almost three year long public health emergency. The public health emergency was a policy decision to take away barriers to allow for greater health equity. So certain things were waived. Certain things didn't have to be done during that public health emergency through waivers. Those are all coming back now. 
So you need to be thinking about if we need to re-implement all of these, I don't want to say restrictive guidelines, but guidelines that were in place for a reason, that's automatically going to take the, the disparity issue and it's going to increase it again. So you're going to want to be thinking about that as the public health emergency ends. So emergency preparedness really is a policy level. It's a, it's a public policy decision to say, we are going to methodically plan so that when we have that bad event happen, we're going to try to make sure that the patients that we serve are able to still live their best possible lives while they're going through that emergency. That's really the foundation for emergency planning. And we couldn't have a better audience to do that for because a lot of us are dealing with vulnerable populations. We're dealing with the elderly population. Um, so that I would argue is, is a target group that we, we owe that to. Next slide, Amy. So here's just a few questions, and I don't know how Tony and the Superior um, group want to think, think about this or go through this, but I'm going to pose a question to the group, and I think it would be okay if people unmuted to answer. I also think it would be okay if um, they use the chat, and I see, Tony, you're nodding your head. Absolutely. So, all right, I'll move ahead with your blessing. Let's start <laughs> with the first one. Scenario is this, you have to evacuate your building and it is time sensitive. Who do you remove first? Anybody have an answer to that? Try to think through a health equity lens. Ambulatory first. Okay. So if we had to triage them, would you say green first? Yes. Okay. And that is the answer, but often we get um, our most vulnerable. People will say get the most vulnerable out of that situation first because it's you're going to need to restabilize them and they view them as a higher priority. But if you think from an equity perspective, it's do the greatest good. There's also some ethics in there as well. You're probably going to have more ambulatory people that you can get out more efficiently and more quickly, thus allowing you more resources to go back for those that may be yellows or reds. Amy, is there anything that you wanted to add to that, Amy? No, other than I think, you know, you said that is the answer. I think, you know, it, it really is is based in an, it's an ethical issue. And it, it is something that, um, you know, in some ways, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, but there are certainly some answers that are probably better than others from a health equity lens. And, and so that is absolutely true. Um, and again, I'm going to promote the one book that really talks to this is five days at memorial um if you have not read that book that talks about hurricane katrina and what happened in the hospital um called memorial um and and what happened with some of their patients that absolutely could not be moved i mean that is something it, it's a really important and great story um difficult story to read but encourage you to do so go on to the next one so you've evacuated how are you going to transport them? What kind of MOUs do you have? Everyone continues to say, we'll just get the bus company. That's not necessarily the best answer. Um, Brian, you want to add any to yeah, well, or anybody else? Yeah, one of the comments I see Mark made, um, multiple bus companies, including wheelchair accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and again, think, think through the spectrum. Um, people think mobility. And there are disparities down here, and there are fewer disparities up here. And those that are able to get on a normal bus, by all means, that's what you're going to do. That's the equitable decision for them. But some, but some may need very specialized care. 
and they may need to be transported via ambulance. Yeah. Yes, and somebody had the, the question of what is an MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, sometimes they're called MOAs, Memorandum of Agreements. Um, it's, it's sort of like that agreement with the public transportation um, or the county snowplow drivers. You have a sort of a gentleman's agreement to say, they're going to plow out our primary roads first so that we know we can get our staff to work. Um, personal vehicles, yes, that, that can and will happen. Um, do you build into your plan that if an evacuation occurs, families will be called and families will have the opportunity to transport their loved ones? That's going to do two things. It's going to free up your resources to be able to continue to work on the bad incident. And it's likely going to de-escalate the anxiety and the mental health issues that that individual may, may be experiencing. And that's another thing to think about is we all know during that incident, anxiety levels escalate, um, acute health issues can come up at that time. Be thinking about what the person in room two needs to be able to de-escalate versus what the person in room three needs. They may need two totally different resources. One of them may simply need a volunteer to come in and hold their hand and talk to them. And that's an equitable um, resource allocation. Somebody may need a much more robust um, cadre of resources to be able to get to the same outcome. Just looking at some of the chats here, family volunteers, um, should, should this be sensible given other physical plant parking, et cetera? Um, several ambulances being listed. Be careful as the ambulances may not be available. Um, the concept behind that is if the incident is big enough to impact your facility, there's a pretty good chance that those 911 calls are increasing significantly um, and your units are not going to be pulled out of service to come and help you. They will when it be, they become available, but they're going to have to do some backfilling. Brian, I would just also say one of the things that we had an experience with in, in the Northwest Wisconsin region is we had a nursing home that needed to evacuate um, and all they had available to them were school buses. And so what they ended up doing is they opened up the back emergency exit door and they used mega movers um, and the fire department, volunteer fire department to literally lift those residents into the back of that bus. Um, not the best case scenario, but it was a, one thing that did work. Um, so, you know, having those kinds of tools, those mega movers, and then the volunteer fire department, having the, the muscle and the strength to be able to do that, super important and made all the difference. I'll put the yeah. book in here. Yeah, Amy will put that book in for reference. Um, Tony et al., I think at this point where we are on time, um, folks can see the last two questions and they can work through them um, on their own. We could address them as a large group, but I'd like to offer it back to you to see if there are other questions that may be outside the scope of this last slide um, that we could potentially address. Sure. Um Thanks, um, Brian. Well, so again, just want to open up. This is a great conversation that we're having. Lots of good feedback, lots of questions. So does anyone else have any questions um, related to um, the presentation and how they might go about, um, you know, including or how they are including the, the kind of um, making sure that their plans address some of these issues that that Brian and Amy have discussed. I, I thought this was a, I, I, it's a great conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, made, I think we've all been given a lot of food for thought um, in this. So I'm just curious if anyone else ha has any just general comments or how have they started to think about their emergency preparedness plans in this way and addressing some of the social uh, inequalities in, in our communities? I will post those slides again. Uh,
Well, Tony's doing that. Again, I mentioned that everybody's worst nightmare is that evacuation or something that is really going to escalate your, your patients and your residents. Be thinking about um, there is a tool out there for identifying functional and access needs, and it's designed to be used. Really, it's designed to be used in a shelter situation, but it could very well apply to, I think, a lot of the facilities that you folks represent. And what it is, is you don't need a high level of training to go through this checklist. You're basically buddying up with one of the patients and it walks you through and asks questions. Does this person have eyeglasses? Does this person need an inhaler? Just those basic functional access need things so that as you, you start to settle that individual into their perhaps their new location or their temporary location you already have a list of some of those functional access needs think of them as comfort needs those things that they'd use on a day-to-day -day basis to maintain their normal quality of life you can have then runners or volunteers going around trying to find some of those resources. So it's a quick real-time tool to help you identify what some of those functional app um, and access needs are. And I would be happy to, after the fact, send that tool um, over to Tony and, and you can disseminate it as you see fit. We'd, we'd be happy to do that. This whole conversation is making me excited for the next time that we meet where we kind of continue along the same vein, but a little bit different talking about um, diver diversity, um, you know, and diversity and equity sort of go hand in hand. So um, we're excited to, to talk about that next. Any other questions or any comments before we part today? I did think the conversation about how getting people like in a snowstorm that we had some interesting people were cross country skiing in and and some people had used snowmobiles. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting too. just again something to think about, like, just sort of outside the box, how could people, how could people get there? How could you get people there? Mm -hmm. Tony, so I don't know, partnering with the snowmobile association, maybe, you know, if you live it, I mean, you know, just thinking like kind of out there about those things. There are snowmobile clubs in all corners of yep. the geographical areas that we represent. And believe me, they want to help in situations yeah. like this. Yep. At, come, go to one of their meetings or invite them to one of yours. And I guarantee you, you'll get a written agreement out of that. And boy, they'll be there for you. Yep, absolutely. One last thing I put in the chat was the FAST teams. Anybody remember those teams? Um, that was a training that was pretty popular a few years back. Um, I, When I worked, again, in my Red Cross shelter days, um, boy, again, every single person in that shelter had some sort of functional or access need. And sometimes it was simple as, as Brian said, replacing that pair of eyeglasses. Anybody who wears corrective lenses, whether it's contacts or glasses, we are part of the people that have functional and access needs. Because if I don't have access to my glasses, I can't read. I can't drive safely. Um, and if the tornado comes and takes that stuff away from you, you you are you have a disparity. And so sometimes we don't always think of ourselves as being part of that population. But I am. I wear contacts. Um, you know, I see Tony, I see Brian, I see lots of eyeglasses. So something to think about. Well, thanks again. This has just been a wonderful uh, conversation. Again, lots of food for thought and, um, you know, I can, you know, opportunities maybe to for certainly for improvement in the emergency preparedness plan. So, um, and there's Amy and Brian's contact information. Um, so feel free to reach out to them and or to Superior Health. Um, and let's see, we have one last quick slide. Um, uh, Allie, I think, um, what is it after that? Oh, maybe she didn't include, oh, nope. Okay, oh, Sarah, we must not have included it. So just a reminder that Superior Health um, 
is offering to review your emergency preparedness uh, plan if you're a nursing home facility. And we have a great tool that was developed by a subject matter expert and it uh, addresses all of the elements in Appendix Z. So feel free to reach out to, to one of the team members here from Superior Health and we'd be happy to get that facilitated for you. So thanks very much.